Hello, hello. Can everybody hear me? All right, cool. Hey, everyone. Uh, happy Tuesday. I am Teddy Andres, coordinator of sculpture here at Anderson Ranch, and welcome to our summer faculty lecture series. I'm excited and honored to introduce Padma Rajendrin. Rod Rajendrin, sorry. Uh, we will, she will present for 20 minutes, followed by a 10 minute question and answer period. So look forward to, so we look forward to your questions. Before we begin, I'll just ask that you guys please silence your cell phones. All right, thank you. All right, so Padma was born in Klang, Malaysia. She studied in Burn Mar College and received her MFA from Rhode Island School of Design. She was exhibited at the International Print Center New York, Ortega y Gasset Projects, uh, Beers London, Field Projects, September Gallery, BRIC Arts Media, Icon Gallery, Tamor Grand Gallery. Can you guys still hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, and most recently, a solo show at Southeast Cooper Contemporary. She le lives and works in Catskill, New York. She works and focuses on fabric experiments with the clash and combination of patterning and storytelling. Her content-rich compositions reference the duality and contradictions of culture and the multifaceted definitions of universal heritage. She has completed residencies at Ortega y Gasset Projects, the studios at Mass Mocha, Women's Studio Workshop, Oxbow, and Lower East Side Print Shop. Her work has been featured in Cro Chronogram Magazine, New American Paintings, Art Maze Magazine, and Make Magazine. Please welcome to the stage, Padma. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. Um, Okay, great. Um, so I just want to say thank you again to the Anderson Ranch community for the invitation to be here, for teaching here in person, and like participating in this vibrant community this summer. I'm really, really thrilled to be back um, here, and and I'm also very excited to be sharing my work with all of you. So. Um, so for the past few years, I have been primarily working on textile for its tactility, reference to the body, place, hand of the artist or the machine, and fabric triggers something within all of us. You know, we all have a relationship with, with it. We all wear clothes. Um, we all occupy fabric to achieve rest. And in the realm of the uniform or cultural dress, it does provide clues to our identity and to our purpose. So my work for the last eight years has explored a kind of symbolic commotion and pattern play that emphasizes the jumbled nature and contradictions of truth and tradition and how that plays out in fabric. And... So my work is talking to place as well. So my childhood started in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, and I took this picture of the desert when I was about five or six years old. And the ideology of being a foreigner or an outsider in the place that I spent the most time on, uh, most time in, uh, was very present and something that I always had known even then, but definitely did not feel uncomfortable by that thought at the time. And since I was a child, I, I had always liked looking at what I what was considered art, cultural art objects. So watching people interact and and being the observer was was something that I did often. And because I had lived in other countries when I was young, looking at these cultural art objects from my own and also different cultures has always fascinated me. And finding the connection points, similarities between them, and most often uh, these objects were folk art objects. So um, they, these are carved, colored, or created by some local artist or a series of artisans. And most importantly, they are accessible to many, you know, not that many people would necessarily buy them, um, but that they um, are out in the open. And they may only appeal to certain audiences, but there's a clunkiness of line and, and of form. But they are visible, and they're not usually prerequisites to how they are physically handled. And most often, 
folk art objects are seen as souvenirs um, meant to authenticate experience of the traveler, but the layers of meaning behind um, these objects I find really fascinating. So the next few slides are images of objects and visuals of ceremony within South India's Hindu population that come up um, as visual symbols and connection points into my storytelling and in my work. But in my work, they don't often carry the same um, meanings as they do in real practice. And, um, but here they'll exist as a reference uh, to you. So the ceremonial platter on the left is gift um, or blessing and offering of fruits, um, sometimes even called archana in specific settings. And the decoration of sacred site is on the right. And here is a visually busy and typical market scene from India where the woman in the foreground is stringing jasmine flowers for a hair garland. And this photo is an example of a building facade and window screen that I took when I was last in India. And the traditional mat on the left is one very typical to South India and often used as a support for the body for sleep on the ground or a possible place to sit. The bucket and pitcher on the right is a humble icon of Indian life um, and its function includes bathing, washing clothes, or storing water. On the left, uh, these chipples or flip-flops are ubiquitous and iconic in my mind when I recall daily life in India. They are not just worn casually, they are a part of daily trips, work days, hard labor, and playtime in the street or field. And on the right is a traditional grass broom that is inexpensive and invaluable to Indian homes. Um, these, the setting of these objects and rituals and gestures um, really allow space um, and also informs the details of the stories within my work. So Kolam or Rangoli, um, as it som sometimes is called, um, these drawings are a ritual that starts the day in Tamil Nadu and is performed by women. Uh, the design acknowledges the threshold as the receiver of blessings from Lakshmi, the goddess of prosperity, and, and the home. And the symmetry of these designs is important. And within my own miniature depictions of Kolam, um, it sits in the periphery, not to negate its importance, but to reiterate that Kolam exists within the margins of the day. It is a protective frame for the day to begin. And this miniature depicts how I think of interior spaces um, as protective and walled with a particular kind of life growing within the space. And I think visually this represents it best, you know, as one beautiful and lacking a realistic view or understanding of logic. It is floaty or dreamy without that perspective of logic and a space um, you know, that needs constant tending. So acknowledging architectural cues and also acknowledging cultural objects of ceremony from across the world is still very much part of how I start to make my work, um, but in connection to textile. So to me, they are coming from the same pattern, building, or structural drawing ideas. And these reference photos mark a, a distinctive mood, um, you know, to include my reference of textile and language pattern and a regionalism found within fabric. And my interest in textile as a vehicle of connection became increasingly important. Um, the performance of buying saris, the codes behind colors, prints, and the act of wearing cultural dress um, is, is of particular interest to me. And I became fascinated in borders and patterns and why the paisley pattern is everywhere, um, you know, everywhere in the world and why my mother um, has always called it a mango instead. And, and associating certain woven textiles with geography, place, and identity became richer. And in the search, the need to provide more space to celebrate and make it visible, even if it was just for myself. So, um, oh, sorry. Um, these sari series prints were motivated by the function of the border and how its decor decorative purpose is to frame the center, however loose and light it may be. And the border holds power of how we interpret what is at the center. This information often is decorative and repeated, and it is often where labor and sentiment reside. So on the left, there are banana leaves sitting at the bottom of the paper, as if on the floor, ready for the meal to begin. And these are common symbols of food and place in Tamil Nadu in South India. And each image in the series has a theme 
um, guiding the events and movement of the print. The placement of gold ink and metal leaf is essential. A gold border elevates the content within, provides value to the object, it indicates prosperity regardless of what might be true or at the center. And gold within the margins is a specific way to communicate opulence, value, beauty, generosity, and ties to the divine. And the Paisley, the Paisley mango design is often repeated as a decorative embellishment um, in textile designs across the world. And I became interested in naming this repeatable image and making individualistic iterations um, of the mango and in some ways partially inventing tropical fruit. Um, and the work is influenced by a ritual, ritualistic performance of sari shopping um, that I often did in Chennai, in Tamil Nadu, and um, the tradition of presentation within South Asian culture. Uh, so the content in the prints began to take on the acknowledgement of symmetry and structure of shrine. Uh, textile, with its flexibility and form and ease of access, became the next material to creating um, these pieces. So a lot of decorative textile imagery is wishing to the present or future, and adorning one's world with imagery symbolizing abundance and prosperity is very much emphasized in global cultures, especially within South Asian culture. Uh, but this idea is inherently to tie to fecundity so fruit and the female body are linked and even cultural imagery can connect the two and I do think that about this notion of fruitfulness within the home um, how it functions as a blessing and burden and fruitfulness is derived uh, traditionally from the female body so a lot of decorative textile imagery, again, is wishing to the present or future and adorning one's world with imagery symbolizing abundance, prosperity is very much emphasized um, in these cultures, especially within Hinduism in India. But this idea is um, you know, tied to this fruit and female body. And I do think um, about, about these connections um, to immigrant life as well. Um, so in this piece, in the midst of ruin, an earthen cave is a palace. Um, here the emblematic and central world of one's interior silently accompanies the large bold gestural hands reaching out for these very particular symbolic objects. Um, and yet they, they're not holding anything in the grasp. They're, they're always so close, but they're not, not quite there. And this piece, Original Shell, is a narrative-based silk painting made with resistant dyes. And the elements are derived from imagery and ideas of South Asian entranceways and decorative textile structures to support this nomadic narrative and the search for prosperity and abundance through many iterations of migration. So in many places, a woman's worth is still linked to her ability to produce offspring and to be a domestic provider. And I don't think we talk about it in the US in the same way, um, but it is present. And in migration, the role of women is crucial to establishing prosperity or success. And so women across the world um, work inside and outside of the home, and this labor extends through the family in her charge. So traditionally women that come to a new place or a new country um, often establish their home as an annex of the previous home or homeland, and they are responsible for providing through and for the performance of the body. Um, so food and textiles have a lot to do with providing this literal and emblematic comfort. And so connecting more to these ideas of folk art and reflecting on what would be considered American notions um, of folk art, I look to interventions and embellishment and decoration on clothing. And further, where genes indicate hierarchy, class, ideology. And I'm curious about the myriad of meaning genes have and that for many people, wearing or adorning um, them is a, is a wish of sorts. And it's not just casual or ultimate comfort, but the wearer of jeans indicates ideas and hopes for her life. In some areas of the world, to wear jeans as a woman means you're educated, and in other circumstances, places her body in a vulnerable situation. So these American dream jeans are prized garments. They're not for everyday wear. These pants are in conversation with the West, and um, which for the wearer, it could be um, appears to be global and cosmopolitan in attitude, despite um, their effort to conceal struggle and make home in a place that questions their belonging. And American Dreams 2, Dream Jeans 2, continues the narrative. 
And here is um, an installation view for scale. And um, this is an installation view of um, a show that I did in Brooklyn. And these, there are ceramic and wood facades of vessels at the top and on, on walls that speak to a home space um, that resides at the margins to support the interior. And I do consider um, a lot about the transformation that occurs in art, art occupied spaces and how viewers move and interact of you know, being aware of one's body in a space and how it can move and feel differently when, when um, you're, you have that really positive encounter experience. And so I do want to shift the conversation of how we view and interact with art. And I do think spaces and communities like Anderson Ranch are also uh, continuing this conversation through open interaction and inclu inclusive curation and events. And I deeply consider my audience as an integral part of how the work functions. I aim to rid the performance anxiety that comes with, you know, participating with art um, as we conventionally are used to. And instead of, um, and instead asking audience, um, the audience to get comfortable, um, to stay, to reduce the expectation that being at an opening is purely social um, or even entering the gallery is purely about viewership. So I'm also interested in making spaces that are welcoming to an intergenerational audience. This has been an interest of mine for a few years. Um, a lot of that has to do with observing visitors at museums um, when working as a teaching artist and then also observing my own parents in art settings. And thinking more closely to the events of traditional domestic spaces, how these rituals function and realizing that they're not often evidence um, for women's traditional labor or even their stories. But in terms of what is traditionally made, um, many of these items are consumed. They are worn and have ultimately or will ultimately disintegrate over years in many forms and goes back into the earth. Um, this lunch project started in 2014 as an attempt of recording um, and giving evidence to this labor, connecting the kitchen making process to the studio making process, and embracing the concept of gift or offering, and how this is so commonly across the globe done with food. So this project, um, for this project, I provide a homemade lunch to someone. I don't at this point, I don't know too well. Um, it has had many iterations in the past, um, but I essentially drop it off um, with them after they agree to participate. And they, um, I ask them to eat the meal alone. And in the participation, they are also required to fill out, to write um, answers to provided prompts. So how food and gift exists in memory and record is something continuing to be explored in this project. Um, I have not done any lunch projects during pandemic times, um, so it's been some time, um, but it is something on my mind as we rely so much on food to be part of how we take care of ourselves and um, bodies while still being you know, quite busy. So, the question here um, that's posed is so much of what guides my thinking within myself and across audiences. This piece entitled Lemon Life recalls a way of life outside of the North Americas where life is sustained by preparations and protection of one's water. Um, for me, that is a stand-in of prosperity and fertility. And lemons have traditionally provided blessings and protection um, in, in Hindu culture, but it's referred to in America as a term of bad luck. So lemon life is living between these two meetings um, and the duality and contradictions of its reading. And communicating to the past and future simultaneously is really important to me. In my mind, dreams and wishes begin at the juncture of interior and exterior space. And I'm revisiting ideas of the threshold and often the imagery and objects that I'm making relate to normalizing contradictions and functioning in both existences 
the structure and materiality of this piece exists as a as a panel, um, a kind of collapsible or portable wall for a dwelling, and it is meant to function as um, also this mural and to reinforce the celebration and protection of water as a source of life and connection to this full cup of prosperity. And below the auspicious nine flames or nine planets connect to the world um, as it communicates to the heavens. And drawing is the starting point of my process. I was intentionally thinking about layering of textile reference and placing um, and playing with pattern and architectural cues. So for this piece, I want I wanted to get um, very specific about my conversation with the palette and the stacking of information and reference. You know what is seen as welcome or a symbol of protection to some, and you know possibly hostility as a barrier to others. And this is the work in progress. And about to enter acknowledges the contradictions of coming home, um, the conflict between race and belonging, and the wishful symbols of blessing for the threshold. The gesture of the body um, is also visible in a fractured sense. So with all the references to Western and Eastern hemispheres and architecture, quilt ideas, um, bandanas, the linguistic connection to Hindi and San Sanskrit um, indicating to tie or to bind, playful gestures in, in nature, um, kolam that is in the exterior and interior ritual. Um, I am having a conversation with duality, the fractured sense of the body. And I was very conscious about indicating in this piece um, with different shades of blue as representative of darkness and skin color. And, oh yeah. Um, so also part of my process, um, my teaching opportunities do influence my work. Um, this is a picture of last, from the last time I was here um, in person in 2019. And, um, you know, we have a makeshift clothesline right now um, down by the print studio. And with this, this picture always like brings me joy because it just, it looks really vibrant um, to me, it's very sweet in the setting. It's still, you know, sweet down there. But it re does remind me of the task of, you know, putting clothes on the clothesline. Um, you know, the women of my family, um, whenever I was in India, I would be doing this on rooftops. And the shared labor of this task um, really makes me recognize the memory and connection um, to that. And that's something that didn't happen when contemplating this task at home when I would do it uh, by myself. Um, but being here and, and really being able to observe this site, um, let me let me do that. And other res you know residencies or teaching opportunities let me kind of experiment and decide um, to explore different ways of interacting with community, um, be it more quiet. Um, so this is a picture from a little essentially kind of a drawing, um, a community drawing that happened a few years ago at Oxbow. And um, I think about games a lot, like word search, um, and particularly what does it mean to embrace and circle words, um, to find words, um, to go hunting or searching for, for words. And that has also led me to thinking about other ways to make that possible. Um, I really love sending mail, um, this idea of how um, experience can kind of travel through time um, and, and exist, um, how the past exists differently um, when found, found in someone's future, um, but how to also extend this kind of practice of finding and circling words to someone else. And... Oh, and often I do get intimidated to start new work. Um, so playing with different materials um, often becomes a plan in the end. And so it lets me react to the limitations and unique language of a material um, itself and not feel so stuck in my head um, about a daunting project or deadline. So this is a little, um, in some ways, like just a... 2D ceram, you know, a clay drawing, painting, and it allowed for this larger um, fabric piece to develop. 
and you can see that that piece is installed here. Um, and this is a show that I had called Move Me With You in Brooklyn. Um, and a lot of it had to do with the vulnerability and trauma of moving from one place to another, which I think often gets overlooked unless it is part of one's personal history. And like myself, um, many people come to New York uh, as a place of new beginning, only to move multiple times. And, and we do this in our life anywhere outside of you know New York. Um, but as we as we carry the memory of all the homes we've inhabited to each new place, um, this repetition and urgency of moving does ask, you know, what are we allowed to bring? So the, the convenience of material and the emotional meaning embedded within objects are really thoughtfully considered, um, I think, when you're moving. So I do answer with the scenes, objects, and reminders on the material that, um, you know, it is the most portable and simultaneously can occupy the most space. And, and that's another reason why I really love working with, with textile. And storytelling through these dyed and printed scenes does reveal connections of our present um, to the past and unite global origins to the, to the local. So thinking of this hallway as a liminal space, my goals here were to reveal hidden stories, um, to the slow moving viewer, or even offer a soft wave of lightly tacked fabric to, to the brisk walk, walker. So um, as someone moved through this hallway, um, things would flutter, things would move. And, um, you know, I, I did think about how portable walls could, you know, be potentially um, made. And I wanted to reimagine this idea and um, reimagine migratory space um, that we consistently create for ourselves. So um, this, this piece um, is still thinking about shaped um, shape pieces. I use a lot of palm trees um, within my work, and it's, for me, a reference to a past life, um, you know, like a homeland, um, and uh, also moving. You know, Saudi Arabia palm trees are very much visible. And um, thinking about the past, how that exists at the forefront, but also reaching towards the future. And this uh, reach is often visible within my work, the reach, um, but not yet necessarily like the holding um, or the receiving of something. And my work is continuing this idea of shrine and monument in different forms, um, but moving towards engaging with site specificity and installation that also shifts away from the wall. I do consider the possibility of how viewers can enter another location by viewing the work and are you know, requiring that they are possibly underneath um, going to use this, that they're underneath um, and moving within and around the piece itself and explore its own repetition of um, symbol and space. And since the start of the pandemic, um, you know, early 2020, I was doing a lot of drawing and just managing a lot of looking. I still think I'm like affected, my art practice is affected by um, by those early days. And, and these art objects have held my interest and they still do. Um, and I was really doing a lot of, uh, you know, translation. Um, you know, sometimes it's one-to-one -one into ink, but it really does provide room to invent and declare hiding spaces. And in particular, I've been focusing um, on the 16th century miniature from Central India that includes in the lower left, right here, um, two women in conversation. And in the repetition of pandemic days, you know, focusing on connection um, and also being confined in interior space was something I was really thinking about and um, emphasizing the repeating conversation between these two women and the continuation of the same interior space felt really relevant as a connection to pattern play um, that occurs um, in textile. So there's a few more images of these. And during the pandemic, I have been grateful to have opportunities um, to collaborate with different people and organizations. So I did create a suite of Rizzo prints, um, a Rizzo graph prints, um, printed at UT Austin in 2020. And the, those derived from the, the ink drawings. And then later I translated that into, um, just last year into these smaller dye works on silk that are a direct, direct translation of those Rizzo prints and also the indigo ink drawings. 
And I've also collaborated with a ceramicist and these fabric pieces have been influenced by some of the research that I did into medieval pharmacy jars and tiles. And since giving birth um, to my daughter 10 months ago, I really truthfully haven't been able to finish much um, larger textile work. But, um, you know, I've had these piece, fabric pieces in progress, but one of the elements I love working with, um, you know, just with clay is that it brings me out of myself um, a little bit and also it has its own demands. Um, so clay needs continuous attention, tending, alteration, protection, and that really pushed me to getting these wall pieces completed. And working with clay also allows me to reimagine space um, and how shape holds and interacts with wall or surface very differently than fabric and lets me uh, reimagine my own capabilities. So perhaps it is with the potential of translation to textile or furthering another question or curiosity. So um, those clay pieces led to this shaped fabric um, work that has has quilting in it as well and exists um, very similarly to those those wall pieces. So this is where I end. Thank you so thank you so much. <laughs>
taking care of, of like, the brain, the hand, and like the stomach, you know, like they're like the body is part of that, um, those physical things. And, um, yeah, I don't know if I actually am answering your question, but <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Thanks, Kelly, for that question. Um, it has. I, I definitely do a lot more planning, um, and I feel like I have a, this reservoir of um, possible projects, but my when I'm in the studio, there's this very intense urgency, like making making the work. The time is really limited, and I, I think for a lot of people... Um, because I've talked to to other parents um, that at least for me there's less there's less questions um, it's, you know and less kind of contemplation the kind of like philosophical running around that one does in in um, one's brain and even anxieties um, I just there's a need to make the the thing and um, that really gratefully has has come out but um, in truth, right now, um, sometimes there are really big lapses between me finishing something, um, which I'm hoping hoping to change in the summer. Hi. Um, thank you also again for the whole presentation. It was so lovely. I was so intrigued by those two pieces of like lined paper that had the reflections from the people oh, that you brought yeah. meals to. And I was wondering if there were any like the most joyful or confusing or like exciting things that you got in those reflections that you'd be willing to Oh share. yeah. I mean what was has been wonderful is that most of the time um the people that I have um asked to participate are artists and it's really so wonderful to receive these uh, when I was doing them. They're so, um, they're just so personal and, and like beautifully intimate. And one person who has participated in this project is here. Um, <laughs> um, but it's, it's just really so pleasurable. And um, yeah, it's, it's kind of funny when I'm making, like, even though it's been years since I've made a meal um, for this project, I can immediately be transported into, like, the kind of stress and the, the anxiety of making this meal um, in anticipation for someone, um, like, not knowing, like, what they like to eat, but this idea, which I think happens when we're in the studio, like, we're making... The, ob the thing, the object, um, to fulfill to fill our need, essentially, and to imagine um, that this, this thing, um, whatever we're making, um, will fulfill someone else in, in the same way. Um, and, and so I think that is just, is really, I still feel like a little, like very much connected to that. Um, and, and it's nerve wracking. It's nerve wracking to be in the studio. It's, and I think it can be really nerve wracking to be in the kitchen too. And, but in a really good way where you're infusing in the work, your, your care, your emotions, and, um, and ultimately like all the questions that you may have still translate to um, this this really intentional um, yeah care and and affection um, even if you you don't like know always who your viewer your audience is it's still kind of like loving yeah thanks thank you any other questions all right Thank you so Thanks. much, Padma. Thank you. Thank you.
I didn't mean to put you on. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I just wanted to say that. I mean, I love.